I'm Phil Pratt. I'm the organist here at Christ Episcopal Church in Charlevoix, Michigan, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 online organ concert. Like I did last year, I'm going to begin and end with toccatas. Now, as I mentioned, the word toccata means touch. So an organ toccata is technically a piece that demonstrates the organist's touch on the keys. But the word has come to be associated with flashy, exciting pieces. This first toccata is by Eugene Gigou. He was the organist at St. Augustine Church in Paris for 62 years. And if that's not a record, it's got to be close. He was a very prolific composer of music for the organ. This toccata is one of his best known works. Here is the toccata in B minor by Eugene Chico. through the whole piece, and then a second tune, typically a hymn, that occurs in sections on top of the first tune. In this case, that hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory. Here is God of Grace by Paul Manns.
The Mission was a very powerful movie. It came out in the late 1980s. It was based on a true story of a group of Jesuit priests who were reaching out to the Guarani tribe in South America in the mid-1700s. Near the beginning of the movie, there is a pivotal scene that involves the head of the order, Father Gabriel, and an oboe. It introduces this tune, which is then used frequently throughout the rest of the movie. Here is Gabriel's Oboe by Ennio Morricone. The words te deum, are Latin for you, God, it's actually short for te deum laudamus, we praise you, God. Hymns that begin with those words are often referred to as te deums. Likewise, the musical settings of such hymns are also called te deums. There have been many te deums composed over the centuries, Marc Antoine Charpentier, who lived back in the 1600s, actually composed six of them, although two of the six have just kind of disappeared into history. Nobody 
knows anything more about them these days other than the fact that they existed. Of the remaining four, the most well-known is the one in D major, mainly because of the popularity of its prelude. Here is the prelude to the Te Deum by Marc-Antoine Charpentier. to be honored in all sorts of ways. I'm familiar with it because my father-in-law went on an honor flight and my wife accompanied him all day as his guardian. I had two roles that day. First was to get them to the St. Pete Clearwater Airport first thing in the morning to catch their flight and the other was to be there, be there to greet them when they returned that evening. And that was actually quite an experience. The airport terminal was absolutely packed and as the veterans came in from the plane, they were greeted by this huge crowd cheering them, welcoming them home and thanking them for their service. And all throughout the crowd, there were people waving American flags and shouting, USA, USA. The whole experience made me think of two patriotic songs. When Johnny comes marching home again and rally round the flag, which is also called the battle cry of freedom. I decided right then I wanted to compose a piece for the organ based on those two patriotic songs. Because they both came from the Civil War, I called the result Civil War Medley. Here it is. Thank you. 
reverie is the state of being pleasantly lost in one's own thoughts. To me it's helpful to picture some idyllic scene, like maybe out in the woods by a babbling brook with sunlight filtering down through the trees. Or maybe sitting on the end of a dock on some beautiful lake watching sailboats glide by. And then while you're picturing that, contemplate something. Could be the meaning of life. It could be, how can I be a better person? Or it could be some treasured childhood memory, like early morning walks with your grandfather. Here is Reverie. Next we're going to turn to two composers who both dominated the style of music that they composed. They were actually contemporaries. They both composed from the late 1800s through the early 1900s. The first one is John Philip Sousa, and he's dominated marches. In fact, people called him the March King. During part of his career, he was the conductor of the U.S. Marine Band. And while he was there, he composed a march for the Marines. He named it after their sacred motto, Semper Fidelis. Here it is. Thank you. 
composer I was talking about is Scott Joplin. And the style of music that he dominated was called ragtime. Individual pieces were called rags. Now a rag is actually a lot like a march. The main difference is rags made heavy use of what's called syncopation. Normally important notes are on the beat. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. With syncopation, some of the important notes are off the beat. Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. I think you'll see what I mean with this next piece. Now, many people consider this piece to be the original rag. Scott Joplin composed it during a period in his life when he was performing at a club in Sedalia, Missouri called the Maple Leaf Club. Here is the Maple Leaf Rag. took 137 years to complete. So how can that be? Well, it actually took place in three separate steps. Step one occurred in 1722 when Johann Sebastian Bach composed a piece called Prelude on a Well-Tempered Clavier. I suspect many of you are familiar with it. I'm sure some of you have played it. Step two occurred 130 years later in 1852 when Charles Gounod took that Bach prelude and added a melody to it to create a solo for either violin or cello with either piano or harpsichord accompaniment. He called it meditation. There were no words. Step three, the final step, occurred seven years later in 1859, 137 years after step one. In this step, Gounod took his meditation and added words to the melody to create Ave Maria. Now, I will not be singing Ave Maria, and those of you that have heard me sing know that's a good thing. Rather, I'm going to play it as a cello solo with harpsichord accompaniment, which means that technically what I'm doing is playing the 1852 meditation rather than the 1859 Ave Maria. But nobody makes that distinction anymore. Whether you sing it or play it as a violin solo or cello solo or tuba solo for that matter, you still call it Ave Maria. So here is Ave Maria by Johann Sebastian Bach and Charles Gounod. Thank you.
The composer of this next piece, Siegfried Kargelert, made his reputation as one of the most prolific composers of music for the harmonium. Now, you may not be familiar with that term, but there are a couple of other terms for it. One is reed organ, and it's called that because moving air, which causes reeds to vibrate, is what produces the sound. The other term, though, is one I suspect many of you are familiar with, and that is a pump organ. The typical pump organ looks like an upright piano with a couple of differences. Above the keyboard, there's a whole row of knobs that you can pull out. On those knobs, there are names like flute and viola and horn. And the sound that comes out of the pump organ is determined by which combination of knobs you currently have pulled out. The other difference is down on the floor, there are a couple of pedals. And as you play, you pump them. That's where the name comes from. You pump them back and forth, and that builds up the air pressure necessary to make the sound. Now, as I said, he was one of the most prolific composers of music for the pump organ, but he did compose some works for the pipe organ, including this next piece. Here is Now Thank We All Our God by Siegfried Kargeler.
my wife Judy and I celebrated our 50th anniversary. And one of the things we did to celebrate was go on a tour of the UK. For both of us, that is our heritage on our father's sides. On Judy's father's side, she is 100% English. On my father's side, I am three quarters English and one quarter Scottish. We both loved the whole trip, but I'll confess to being a little partial to the time we spent in Scotland, because of my heritage, I guess. <laughs> and we learned about some of the history of Scotland and some of the important people like Robert the Bruce and William Wallace and King James. Now, one of the stories about King James concerns the Scottish clans. He was very frustrated with the way they were continually fighting and feuding and at war with each other and decided to try to do something about it. So he called together a secret meeting of the heads of the clans and with his leadership and direction and encouragement, they were able to come up with a peace agreement. That secret meeting supposedly took place in a church, a church known as the Highland Cathedral. Now the piece called Highland Cathedral is one of my favorites, and I looked forward when we were heading on the trip to hearing it performed on the bagpipes while we were in Scotland, and we actually got to hear it three separate times. But whether you hear it on the bagpipes, or played by an orchestra, or on an organ, to me it's still a wonderful piece. Here is Highland Cathedral by Ulrich Roper and Michael Korb.
When I was growing up, I would watch Popeye on television, and maybe some of you did the same. Uh, whenever we watched it, of course, we began by hearing his theme song, and maybe you remember how it ends. I'm strong to the finish, because I eats my spinach. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, you may not remember offhand how it begins, but my guess is you would recognize it when you heard it. It begins with the Sailor's Hornpipe, which is a British sailor's dance. I mention it now because in this next piece we have some fun with the hornpipe. But before we get into it, I need to tell you a little bit about how I heard that piece when I was growing up, which I can virtually guarantee was a little different than you did, mainly because of freighters. Where we lived, freighters passed relatively close to our house. Now, freighters would communicate with other freighters by having an appropriate number of blasts on their very loud freighter whistles. There was quite a bit of freighter traffic back then, so all day long in our house we periodically hear these loud freighter whistles. In particular, when I would watch Popeye and hear the hornpipe, it was relatively common for it to be interrupted by freighter whistles. Now, I do have a reason for telling you that, and I'll say a little bit more about it after this next piece. But first, here is Hornpipe Humoresque by Noel Rothstorm.
you did too. My big question for you is, did you hear the freighter whistles? Now, I do have a couple confessions to make. First of all, there's four places near the beginning of the piece where the composer has two low notes. My confession is, I don't really know exactly what he had in mind, whether it was freighter whistles or a foghorn or something else altogether. But given my background, like I told you about a few moments ago, it just jumped out at me that those were freighter whistles. The other confession is I did slightly change the ending of the piece so I could get in two final freighter whistles. It just somehow seemed like the right thing to do. But anyhow, let's move on. As I said at the beginning of the program, we began with a toccata and we're going to end with a toccata. This toccata was composed for the 20th anniversary celebration of one of the world's largest pipe organs the Hazel Wright organ. It's located in Garden Grove, California at what was at the time called the Crystal Cathedral. It's now called Christ Cathedral. The Toccata was performed at that celebration by the composer, Christopher Pardini. So here is the Toccata on Amazing Grace.